See, I wanted to start this video off by saying that Season 2 of The Boys was mind-blowing, but I have more self-respect than that. I think a much better way of describing it would be... Holy fuck! That was diabolical! From start to finish, I can't remember the last time I was having this much fun with the weekly release of a show. As an avid lover of dark, greedy storytelling, Season 1 of The Boys was already a favorite of mine. But Season 2? That built on the characters, events, and stakes in a way that kept my jaw dropping nearly every episode. But alongside loving The Boys Season 2 from the position of an enthralled viewer, I appreciated The Boys just as much for its attention to detail and nuance when it came to the writing. For those of you who aren't new to the channel, you should know that aside from wasting my days away binge-watching Netflix, Hulu, Disney+, Plus, basically you name it, I stream it, I also spend my days working as a novel and script editor. And the absolute best part about my job is being able to help others who want to write, who want to recognize and master the intricacies of storytelling, those people who want to present their own fictions to the world. And what I've found is the best way to go about achieving this is by taking a look at people's favorite shows and storylines, and then breaking down the specific narrative elements that go into making those storylines so effective. Now, as you have probably guessed by the thumbnail, I want to accomplish all that in this video by focusing on Homelander. While The Boys undoubtedly has a slew of great characters who each hold equally great opportunities for learning about writing, I believe Homelander holds a special spot as being one of the most interesting and complex characters in the show. If any of you writers out there are hoping to create characters with similar journeys to Homelander, or if you are simply interested in seeing the writing choices that contributed to his arc this season, then this is the video for you. So, seeing as how this is part of my How They Did It series, what we are going to do for the next half hour or so is go scene by scene to illuminate all of the subtle writing choices used to progress Homelander from the beginning of the season to the end of the season. And I know, some of you are already getting flashbacks to your ninth grade English class, where your teacher would have you analyze the philosophical meaning as to why curtains were blue, or interpret how a rat trapped in a cage was actually an allegory for the fall of the Roman Empire. But no, that is not what we are doing here. Writing certainly can be philosophical, and interpretive, and subjective. That's why it's art. But in the same respect, writing is a science, a ones and zeros game. And the sooner you start to be able to recognize the objective components that go into making quote-unquote good writing, the sooner you yourself can improve your own writing or maybe just appreciate your favorite narratives a little bit more. So, if you are still with me after all that, here is where the fun starts to happen. To properly understand the narrative choices that went into Homelander's journey in Season 2, we must first understand the difficulty of the task the writers had to accomplish. When you take a step back and look at the story of Season 2 for what it is, you realize just how ridiculous it sounds on paper. A quasi-immortal super-Nazi who was best friends with Goebbels starts to work for Amazon, I mean Vought, and manages to indoctrinate America incarnate into supporting white supremacy by banging his brains out. When the central storyline of the season is described for what it is, it seems utterly nonsensical. But when you watch it, you never get that feeling. In fact, almost everything that happens on screen seems to make sense. And making the ridiculous palatable is the greatest sign of effective organic writing. Now, what I mean by organic writing is that all the pieces of a fiction fit together logically and lead into one another. And this is very important, especially for an over-the-top narrative like what happens in Season 2. A general rule in writing is that the greater the change in circumstance from a character's beginning to their end, the more narrative elements will be needed to organically progress that journey. If my story starts with a guy who is hungry and ends with him eating a sandwich, that's not very complicated, so I wouldn't need a ton of details progressing him from beginning to end. But if my story starts with a guy who was hungry and ends with him joining the Third Reich, that might need a bit more time, care, and explanation for the storytelling experience to feel smooth. The reason that I say all this is so that we have a clear understanding of the difficult task that the writers were faced with. They had to take Homelander, who by my estimation wasn't a Nazi, and believably turn him into someone who supports the spread of Nazism. To put it bluntly, that's a pretty big freaking change. So what narrative techniques were used to create this organic transition from beginning to end? Well, it's a plotline I like to call destruction and rebirth. 
Basically, this is a storyline where a target character is brought to their lowest point, aka destroyed. However, a manipulator character offers the target character a chance at redemption or reclaiming their former status, as long as the target character adopts new allegiances or ideals, aka rebirth. Now, if this sounds familiar, it's because this narrative plotline is not new. Anakin Skywalker went through a destruction and rebirth plotline, as did Loras Tyrell and Theon Greyjoy, and there are many unique takes and variations on destruction and rebirth. But that does not make it any less effective here in The Boys, especially when executed correctly. Understanding all that, what we can do going forward is focus on the specifics of how the writers executed Homelander's destruction and rebirth plotline. Let's start with the destruction phase. While this aspect of the plotline might seem simple at first, there is much more to it than make the character lose everything and feel sad. To achieve a proper destruction, a writer must first ascertain what traits are most central to the target character's identity, along with their greatest strengths, weaknesses, and insecurities. Proper identification of these narrative elements is important because these are what will be exploited in service of the destruction phase. The destruction phase is all about tearing down the identity of a character in order to build them back up as someone else. In order to do that, the traits most central to the character's identity must be targeted. Likewise, either during the destruction phase or before the destruction phase, it would greatly benefit a writer to foreshadow traits that will eventually align with the ideals or allegiance the target character will have once reborn. As an example, Anakin's killing of the Sand People was foreshadowing his eventual turn to the dark side. Also, I guess if you don't want spoilers for Anakin's 15-year-old character arc, turn away now because I will be referencing it a lot. Anyway, I know we are just beginning and this is already a good chunk to keep in mind, but trust me, it will get more simple as we go on. I just feel it is important to establish what we are looking for in the narrative before we dive in. So, what are Homelander's central traits, strengths, weaknesses, and insecurities in Season 2? Well, lucky for us, Season 1 was pretty explicit in establishing them. We know that Homelander has a fixation on truth and transparency. Tell me the truth or I walk out right now. We know Homelander has a fixation on control and self-agency, aka doing whatever he wants. Listen, Annika, I'm the Homelander, mm -hmm. and I can do whatever the fuck I want. And we know that he has a deep-seated need for acceptance, admiration, and affection. You're my good boy. All these characteristics stem from the central experience of his childhood. He had no control, no agency, no love or affection or admiration when he was growing up, and now he seeks to fill his life with all these things. And while this is not an exhaustive list of all of Homelander's traits, mainly because he's a very complex character, these stand as some of his most important character details and the focus of what should be exploited in the destruction phase. Now, getting into the actual nitty-gritty of the scenes, much of Homelander's role in Episode 1 works to reaffirm the most central parts of his identity to the audience. We see him as the adored and respected center of public attention, reaffirming his dependence for admiration and acceptance. Goodbye, brother. Thank you. We see him drink saved breast milk from his former love interest, Madeline Stilwell, reaffirming his need for feelings of affection and closeness. And we see him dominate Ashley, reaffirming his need for control. Ashley! Look at me. Sorry. Sorry. You are dispensable, which means you answer to me. Okay, okay. Now, it's not like any of these traits are new. Again, we saw all of these expressed very well in Season 1. But what the writers accomplish by reaffirming all these central aspects of Homelander's identity in Episode 1 is accentuating them and bringing them to the forefront of the reader's mind. That way, when the destruction and rebirth happens, the viewer has a clear reference point of where the target character began. For another example, this reaffirmation is accomplished in Star Wars when Anakin initially refuses to kill Dooku on a moral basis. Kill him now. I shouldn't. Getting back to The Boys, the first episode also employs a writing technique I mentioned before. We talked about that either before or during the destruction phase, a writer would greatly benefit from foreshadowing traits that will eventually align with the ideals or allegiance the target character will have once renewed. In my best assessment, that happens here. 
After Homelander Donkey Kong claps Blindspot, <laughs> listen to what he says. What made you think I would ever allow a cripple into the Seven? This is a great piece of dialogue that the writers got a ton of mileage out of. In the moment, it seems like something that would be completely natural for Homelander to say, because it is. Season 1 of The Boys showed that Homelander thinks of Supes as a class above everyone else, especially when considering the Seven. Really, he considers himself as the face of the Seven, as its leader and representative. In fact, Homelander believes the Seven is his identity, as if he is the Seven. I doubt you're even cracking the top 20 anymore, and that makes a Seven, me, look pretty ridiculous. All of these pre-established character details work to make Homelander's exclusion of Blindspot seem honest to his character. Homelander sees blindness as weakness, and he doesn't want weakness in the Seven. But getting back to that foreshadowing I mentioned earlier, what this scene does on a narrative level is smoothly introduce Homelander's acceptance of exclusionary ideology, which, as you have probably guessed, is pivotal to Stormfront's character and his eventual allegiance to her. Now, I think it's pretty obvious, Homelander never fully buys into all the white genocide Nazi propaganda Stormfront peddles. It's called white genocide. Hmm. But he is definitely willing to ride the wave, largely because it is not too far from what he already believes. Stormfront's entire goal and mindset is striving for a group of perfect individuals. Actual Nazi ideology was not only prejudiced against Jews and other minorities, but also against those with disabilities or deformities. Basically, by Homelander being exclusionary towards Blindspot for being quote-unquote cripple, it creates a smooth, organic transition later for us to accept that he would be okay with siding with more extreme exclusionary ideology. And it's very good that all of this reaffirmation happened so early, because Season 2 wastes no time in jumping fully into the destruction phase. The first blow to his identity is Homelander's control over the Seven. Stormfront is inducted into the group without Homelander's knowledge, which directly undermines his expressed control that he displayed with Ashley earlier in the episode. And shortly after, the episode doubles down on this by having Homelander become completely invalidated by Mr. Edgar during their confrontation. Initially, Homelander attempts to reassert control over the situation by saying he'll just up and leave Vought. My contract's up end of this year. Maybe it's time I uh, move on. He revels in the idea that he is Voth's greatest asset, giving him all the control in the situation. But Edgar completely shifts the dynamic, basically signaling to Homelander that he has no true power in the negotiation. That you are under a misconception that we are a superhero company. We are not. What we are, really, is a pharmaceutical company. And you are not our most valuable asset. The worst part is that Homelander used himself as a bargaining chip, which means the loss of the negotiation makes Homelander himself feel worthless. This is the first major destruction that his character faces. His entire identity is tied up in Vought. His safe space is knowing that he is important to them. No, no, Stan. I am Vought. By having this taken away from him, he is completely left out of his element. And in a great move of storytelling, the writers chose to instantly show Homelander doing whatever he could to fill that hole caused by his lack of control and agency. This is why he goes to visit Becca and Ryan, a place where he has unquestioned control. But keep in mind, Homelander's arc throughout the season isn't singularly based in destruction and rebirth. If that were the case, he would experience no character progression, meaning stagnation and no personal growth. Alongside the plotline of destruction and rebirth, the writers used the addition of Ryan and Stormfront to elicit aspects of Homelander that we viewers haven't seen before. Let's start with Ryan, and we can touch on Stormfront later. Homelander's relationship with his son, even early in the season, allows viewers insight into a new, genuine side of his character. We get a glimpse into his wants and needs and outlooks. Why this is so impactful on a character level is because it gives justification for why Homelander is so invested in Ryan, while also giving more context to the past. Homelander admits that he has felt isolated because of his superiority. See, sometimes it's hard, Ryan, being superior to every single other person on the planet. It's, it's isolating. 
Of course, this isolation probably stems from a deeper subconscious level of him being literally isolated as a child, but it does give an interesting window to decode Homelander's actions in the past, present, and future. Homelander has the power to do nearly anything he wants, but what he actually desires is to feel accepted and close to others. Homelander, above all else, wishes to be understood and cared for. Have I not been paying enough attention to you? Are you lonely? The only problem is that he is so emotionally stunted and scarred that he doesn't know how to forge actual bonds with others, even though he craves it so deeply. I mean, the scene ends with the most blatant example of his social disability that you could imagine. I love you, son. Now can you say it back? Um, I love you too. This is nice. And the scene immediately following this shows another reason why Homelander is so invested in Ryan. Projection. How do you think he's going to feel when he finds out that you've lied to him his whole life? I think he's going to be happy? Pretty prison. Homelander has emotionally substituted himself into Ryan's current position and is doing everything he can to have Ryan avoid going through what he went through as a child. Though presented in a different way, this is still an attempt of Homelander wishing to exert control, but in this situation, it is directly tied to making up for his lack of control as a child. And to cap off this scene, Homelander states that he is committed to staying around to raise his son through good or bad. I'm not going to get bored and move on. I'm not going anywhere. Of course, this is merely a cleverly placed tool to accentuate the destruction phase of the narrative. We focus on the highs, so the lows feel even lower. When Homelander attempts to have a genuine father-son moment, though in his own maniacal, twisted way... You called me dad. <laughs> It culminates with Becca trying to take Ryan away, and Homelander grabbing her by the arm. Ryan then shoves Homelander to the ground with glowing red eyes, finally showing his latent powers. Homelander actually enjoys what he sees from his visibly distraught son, again highlighting just how screwed up he is emotionally, until Ryan tells him in no uncertain terms that he is unwelcome. I'm nothing like you! I fucking hate you! Leave us alone! Hey, hey. And this is a pivotal moment, because it signals that Homelander has lost control of his relationship with Ryan. And what does he do to cope with this loss of control? He instantly flies back to Vought Tower, his original safe space. This coping behavior is also consistent with information we receive later. So I just I felt like I was drowning. Well, what'd you do? Oh, I took off. Flew away. But since Homelander knows he has no control over Vought, which was demonstrated by his previous conversation with Mr. Edgar, he now seeks to exert control over the Seven specifically in opposition to Vought. Having been rejected by Ryan, he now calls the Seven his family to fill that emotional hole. We are here. Together. Family. You guys. You are my real family. However, this control over the Seven is undermined nearly immediately when Stormfront deliberately defies Homelander. I said he was mine. You snooze, you lose, Gramps. Culminating with her receiving praise and adulation in the closing moments of the episode. This is the beginning of the destruction of two aspects central to Homelander's identity. His uncontested adoration of the masses and his uncontested leadership of the Seven. The next episode opens by re-establishing and focusing on this facet of destruction and Homelander's lack of control over the situation. And as good writing would dictate, the formula the creator set is followed and Homelander flies away to a safe space where he has control. In this case, it is the romantic comfort and closeness that he receives from Madeline Stilwell. This entire sequence in the episode is one of my favorite in the seasons too. Really this episode is just fantastic. The writers made the great choice to put Homelander ahead of the viewers. What I mean by that is Homelander knows exactly what's happening in this cabin because he set it up, while the viewer is trying to catch up to the story by figuring out what's going on. Is Stillwell still alive? Is Homelander hallucinating? Has he gone completely delusional? 
These questions are fostered expertly by the showrunners delaying the answers to Stilwell's appearance, fostering mystery and suspense, each of which are fuel for narrative engagement. But getting back to how this plays into the destruction phase, the show is again accentuating a pivotal aspect of Homelander's character so that when it is destroyed, it's fresh and salient in the viewer's mind. The show is basically saying, look at this thing that Homelander has, now watch us take it away. However, there is some stuff that happens in between that needs our attention first. Since Homelander's breath of control has been shrinking more and more during the destruction phase of his journey, he has to focus his remaining control on smaller and more specific targets. In this instance, it is Queen Maeve. He outs her on national television and then makes veiled threats to Maeve and Elena. But one of the most important moments, character-wise, comes here. I ended the relationship when I joined the Seven. When I met you. Stop fucking lying to me. I'm at my wit's fucking end with the lies. Now, if this seems familiar, it's because it is. Homelander has been battling with lies ever since the season one finale. He has felt lied to and manipulated his entire life, and a lack of honesty is one of the things that seriously pushes him over the edge. While this particular detail doesn't come to head in this scene, it becomes a pretty huge development later on, so I just wanted to point it out. But the real focus of the episode is still on Homelander losing possibly what he craves most, public adoration. This eventually pushes him to confront Stormfront, who delivers some awesome dialogue of foreshadowing. I think that you are the best of us. I think that you are everything we should be. And also a pivotal piece of the destruction and rebirth storyline, the out. You just need a little help connecting with your audience. Well, just know I'm always here. Door is always open for anything. To be specific about this, in a plotline of destruction and rebirth, the out is offered by the manipulating character before or while the target character reaches their lowest point. This is exactly what Palpatine does to Anakin with his story of Darth Plagueis. The out is inserted into the mind of the target character so that when they have nowhere else to turn to at their lowest point, they seek the person who offered a way out. When the scene transitions to Homelander back at his safe space in the cabin, we get to see him rapidly approaching rock bottom. When he literally comes face to face with himself, he can finally recognize just how degraded his existence has become. He calls himself pathetic. You're pathetic. A sentiment that Stormfront first put into the air. I mean, this constant need to be loved by everyone is kind of pathetic, but um, yay. In this moment, Homelander realizes that he is completely alone, and he hates how weak he is. Soon after, in the next episode, we get to see Homelander at his true lowest point, when his standing with the public is completely destroyed after a video showing his recklessness surfaces. This eventually escalates into a full-on protest against Homelander, which triggers a brief psycho moment that I will mention in more detail later. What is important to focus on is Homelander in the depths of his lowest point. He has no control over anything, having lost dominance over the Seven and his son. He has no self-agency, feeling pathetic and worthless. He has no one to show him affection because of his rejection and killing of Madeline Stilwell and Doppelganger. And now, he does not have the acceptance or admiration of the public. The pillars that held up his identity have been completely destroyed, and he is on the verge of a total mental breakdown. At this point, the destruction phase is complete. And this then allows the rebirth phase to begin, when Homelander seeks Stormfront and takes the out she offered previously. Since he has nowhere else to turn to, no safe space to flee and hide, he is resigned to confiding in Stormfront. Of course, the most important part of the rebirth phase is that the target character sees success in the process that the manipulator character has constructed. In this way, the target character buys in and becomes ever more deeply entrenched in the manipulator's schemes. The most common and probably the most effective way for a writer to show a manipulator is for them to renew the important aspects of the target character that were previously destroyed. Let's keep that in mind as we go through the rest of Homelander's scenes. In this particular case of The Boy Season 2, Stormfront entrenches herself in all of Homelander's renewed character aspects. The most immediate rebirth comes from her helping Homelander regain the love of the public by having him buy into her way of interacting with the media. What's up? Uh, 
Me. Five ports. <laughs> Next, she uses herself as a method of renewing Homelander's safe space of affection. While the whole scene might just feel like a three-minute depiction of super sadomasochism, it's actually a great bit of subtle writing, all targeted towards Homelander's rebirth. Remember how we went over how the best serialized narratives organically develop their characters by building on previously established character traits and aspects as the story progresses? Well, this scene is chock full of them. Throughout the season, one of Homelander's major struggles is him constantly being held back from doing what he really wants. He tells himself over and over again that he can do whatever he wants, yet he is very seldom in a position where he actually gets to do that. But Stormfront allows him to be completely wanton and given to his most sadistic desires. She, unlike anyone else so far in the season, offers him complete agency to actually do as he pleases. Do it. You know you want to. I'll cut you in half. Come on. Just as important, though, is what comes next. Back in the season 1 finale, Homelander killed his close romantic partner, Madeline Stilwell, by burning her to death with his laser vision. That same action is used here with Stormfront as his romantic partner, though with the complete opposite effect. Instead of melting and dying, Stormfront enjoys it, invites it. And this leads into the biggest reason for Homelander's early infatuation with Stormfront. Thanks to the scene with his son, we know that Homelander has been in the constant pain of feeling isolated and different from everyone else. Remember, that is why he formed such a close, instant connection with Ryan, because Homelander felt Ryan was like him. And that exact same closeness is created with Stormfront, though it manifests as sexual. Homelander sees that he finally has found someone like him, who won't break, who will accept him completely as he is. He doesn't have to be gentle or controlled around Stormfront. With her, Homelander feels saved from isolation, and that instantly endears her to him. But again, just like the destruction phase, the writers use the rebirth phase to build Homelander's character in ways we had not seen before. Where Stormfront talks about their relationship in a specifically sexual way, Homelander perceives it on a much deeper emotional level. He doesn't just want physical intimacy. Homelander craves true emotional connectivity, the kind that he was not given as a child, the kind he yearned for from Madeline Stilwell, but never felt that he got. Did, did you ever really care about me? You mean everything to me? No. No, no. I mean everything to your job. Homelander is doing his best to make a real human gesture of appreciation, trying to forge that close bond, something we hadn't seen from him before. And this is actually where we slip back ever so slightly into a mini destruction phase. But rest assured, it's all in service to continued rebirth. Homelander finds out that Stormfront lied to him and he destroys his trailer. This of course exploits one of Homelander's major character traits, his fixation on truth and transparency. Again, it was the reason he killed his last romantic partner. And this leads into probably the most pivotal scene in the entire season. Stormfront explains that she is a Nazi. And not just any Nazi, a Nazi connected directly to Himmler and Goebbels. She tells Homelander that she was the first soup created by Compound V. She admits to being a vile, racist, ageless, megamaniacal hyperfascist. And there are two major reasons why Homelander is completely won over by all of this information, both deeply connected to his character. First of all, Stormfront now has successfully pushed all of his buttons. She not only fulfills Homelander's need for affection, she fulfills Homelander's need for someone to want him for him. Again, we get this insight into his character from the previous season finale. Homelander is everything that Stormfront has dreamed of and Homelander recognizes that he is the most important person in the world to her. In a sense, she has reciprocated Homelander's earlier attempt at genuine, non-sexual connection. In tandem with that, Homelander is reaffirmed in his belief that he is no longer alone because he has found someone like him. Everyone I have ever loved is in the ground, and then I found you. We found each other, and now neither of us has to be alone ever again. Stormfront understands the isolation that he felt because she felt it herself. 
So not only does Homelander feel that Stormfront can save him from the pain of isolation, he feels that she personally can empathize with it. Where Homelander felt it was so important to try to rescue Ryan from loneliness, Stormfront embodies Homelander's own rescue. But most importantly out of everything is that the scene completes Homelander's rebirth by having Stormfront fulfill Homelander's need for truth. And that is really what he falls for. Where every important person in Homelander's life had kept secrets from him in some form or fashion, Stormfront is completely and unabashedly honest with him. She just told a man who literally flies around in an American flag that she is a Nazi fixated on creating a legion of super soldiers to wipe out all non-white races. The huge secret, this monumentally risky truth-telling, makes Stormfront the most genuine person Homelander has ever known, regardless of how despicable the truth is. And that is the truth. And he can't help himself but to surrender completely to that. So from there, his new allegiance is solidified. Leading on, another important narrative element that a writer should include in a plotline of destruction and rebirth is showing the target character in their new, manipulated role. This is achieved in The Boys when Homelander goes out to stoke fears with Stormfront. This transitions into Stormfront helping Homelander renew his relationship with his son, giving us this surprisingly touching, genuine moment of Homelander's humanity. And this right here is the high point of Homelander's life. Like, his entire life. And that actually brings us to the coolest writing detail about this entire season. Even though we've spent the last 30 minutes detailing all the intricacies of the destruction and rebirth plotline, I believe The Boys Season 2 is actually a destruction and rebirth plotline as set up for further destruction. Here's what I mean. Typically in writing, stories are constructed in peaks and valleys. Narrative events become more significant the more a character has to change or overcome obstacles. This is why instead of stories of middle class to riches, we have rags to riches. The greater the distance a character travels on their journey in a figurative sense, the more dramatic and hopefully impactful the narrative will be. Now, with that all being said, here is how that relates to Homelander. While I don't have any definitive proof, mainly because Season 3 isn't out yet, I believe Homelander's narrative journey in Season 2 is meant to set up his eventual full-fledged psychotic break down the line. It would have been easy for the writers to simply keep Homelander on a downward trend after killing Madeline Stillwell, leading him to a more and more emotionally damaged state until he eventually went on a murdering spree. But instead of that consistent downward trend, they chose to use peaks and valleys, which is so much more effective. The writers showed Homelander at his lowest point by taking away all of his safe spaces and exploiting his established character weaknesses but then they lifted him back up better than he ever was before. And not only that, he reaches his peak by being vulnerable and forming real human bonds with others. And that is what is so brilliant about this. By the writers creating a scenario where Homelander puts himself out on a limb, confident that he would experience true happiness, but then still taking nearly everything away from him, the writers have therefore constructed a storyline where closeness and vulnerability and human connection have failed Homelander. The exact things that he wanted, to find others like him and to be genuinely connected to others, backfired on him and caused him extreme pain. The only thing he has left at the end of season 2 is the love of his fans, and that is why he could not dare let Maeve take that away. Season 2 shows that Homelander tried to be a loving father. He tried to be a kind and thoughtful lover to Stormfront. He tried to be a good person, at least on some level. And it still got him nowhere. Season 3, or possibly even Season 4, is shaping up to capitalize on the incredibly fragile state that Homelander is in. Most likely by showing him completely untethered. I don't need everyone to love me. Again, this is just my editor's intuition speaking, but if you thought Homelander was terrifying and dangerous before, I think we haven't seen anything yet. Still, before we jump the gun, let's take a moment to appreciate the awesome writing that went into the destruction and rebirth plotline of Homelander in The Boys Season 2. Because that's how they did it. Anyway, thank you all for watching until the end. 
If you like what you heard and want to support the channel, like, comment, and subscribe. If you want to be a real homie, support the channel on Patreon or check out some of my more casual content on the second channel. I'll put a link in the description. As always, it was a pleasure and I'll talk to you all again soon.